All right. Hey, well, one more time, uh, welcome and happy Mother's Day. And that welcome goes out to all of you on any of our campuses across the valley. And those of you who are watching this online, we welcome you. We acknowledge that you're with us. And uh, it, uh, it is, um, it's, a, it's a wonderful day and it's a difficult day. And I just want to acknowledge that we've already done that in this service, but we get it and we have you in mind. And we know that it's just, you know, it's one of those things that gets really personal. We've chosen today to celebrate, and if you were with us last uh, week, I, I told you that uh, we're excited this week because of, uh, well, my wife Lisa is going to bring the message, and I, I could tell you so much about her and why I'm so excited. Now, she's done this every other year on Mother's Day for the past two plus decades. Every time I ask her, uh, it's a journey uh, to convince her to do it, um, but I just... It's one of these things where if you come to Central, if you know her, you have a much better understanding of what's actually happening here. Uh, there's so many things I could tell you about her. I'm not going to take a lot of time, but I can tell you she's a mom of two, and her two kids love her and love Jesus. And I could tell you that she's the grandmother of eight. Uh, they love her and they love Jesus. I, I could talk to you about uh, just her... Uh, her ministry, she has, and I, this is going to sound, because you just don't know, because I don't talk much about it, and you don't get a chance to hear her. She literally has an international ministry. She travels all over the world. She meets with foreign leaders. She it talks about principles of peace and women in leadership. On three different occasions, she has met and talked to Pope Francis in the Vatican about that. She knows foreign ministers. She knows mayors from around the world. She just is this... It, this person who has this ability to build relationships. And, 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 and so she heads up a ministry, this international ministry called Amplify Peace. She has a podcast she puts out. She's a co-host of a radio show. It's, I could just go on and on and on. And I, I would just tell you this, that in the early days of our life together, we, uh, by the way, we've been married somewhere between 40, uh, th uh, 44, 43 and 44 years which is really amazing because I'm only 44 and she's only 43. So we met in the nursery and has been this thing ever since. But um, as, uh, as it goes in the early years of our marriage, uh, I was kind of a public, uh, I was a preacher. I'd be out front and she'd sit and listen. And often when we'd be somewhere, um, we'd be introduced as uh, this is uh, Pastor Cal and his wife, Lisa. And sometimes, you know, people would say things like, well, what do you do? And nowadays, because of her international stature, uh, we travel and often uh, it'll be introduced. This is Lisa Jernigan and her husband, Cal. And somebody will come up and say, well, what do you do? <laughs> really nothing, nothing much. I am so delighted for you to get to know her because you're going to hear her heart. Uh, we've asked her not just to think about Mother's Day, but to think about women and leadership and how we can be better. And that's what she's going to address. So it is a thrill for me to have you get to meet her. Would you please do what you do so well? And that is make her feel welcome to her church, Lisa Jernigan. There she is. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning. It is such a privilege and honor to be here with you. And, you know, um, I love that guy, but he can, he's a preacher and he can exaggerate a little bit, so just consider that there. Um, that video earlier, ah, wow, all the emotions of that, right? And, and it just reminds me that the importance of family, and I, I think of today and I think it's family, it's family time coming together. And you know, we have our families of origin, and then we have the families that we choose. And Central has been a family that we have chosen. You, as a church family, have been so instrumental and so important in our lives as we were raising our children, as we've just gone through life for 35 years, you've been a part of our lives in such a personal way, and we're just so grateful. So thank you for being in the journey and all the, all the emotions that go with that. So honored to be here. Where our family is a family of readers. So the Jernigans and the Wordwords, there were three generations of that love a good story, that love a good book. And stories, you know, the thing about stories, they're captivating. Stories are intriguing. Stories are educational, inspirational, and even transformational. 
They can take us to new lands and new destinations and new places that we only dream of ever going there. They allow us to escape into that place. And if it's a really good story, you never want it to end when you're reading a book. You don't want to see the words, the end, because it's just it's brought you in so much. But like any good story, there are some common elements to a story. There is conflict. A good story usually has conflict. It has the plot that's been set. It has tension. It has mystery. It has suspense. Suspense. It has extraordinary characters, and it usually has some kind of a theme woven throughout. And those are the elements that really draw us into a good story. John Capecci and Timothy Gage said this, the ability to see our lives as stories and share those stories with others is at the core of what it means to be human. You see, it is through these stories with each other that we share our hopes, our dreams, our fears, our sadness, and our joy so we can better connect as humans, as friends, and be be intentionally find our commonality with each other. You know, we live in a world that we tend to focus on what divides us, where we are different, and we tend to camp out then instead of going, where do we share the same space? Where's our commonality, and how do we really stay in that place and turn our attention there? Well, stories help us understand God. They help us understand others, and they help us understand ourselves. And through these stories and understanding our relationships with God, with others, and with ourselves, we find meaning in life and purpose, and that it matters. Each one of us, I want to suggest, is a living story. We're a story in the making. We're full of chapters and, and, and words, and you know, it's always evolving, and we're always turning pages in our life. And when so, we don't really know how it's going to end, but it's living, it's active. Sadly, we have become a culture that's known for talking more than listening. Um, We live in a world that is very noisy. We're quick to speak and we're slow to listen. And that is causing us some problems in our world today because everybody wants to share an opinion, everybody wants to share where we're different instead of just taking the time to sit and to listen. So today I wanna focus our attention on this concept of listening. Listening to the stories all around us and the difference it can make in our lives when we truly listen. So our big idea today is to listen is to love and love responds with empathy and compassion. Now I wanna ask you a question. I love questions, I just gotta tell you, and there's gonna be a lot of questions today that I'm gonna ask of you because I think questions take us to a place of discovery and allow us to think and go maybe somewhere or think about something we would not normally do. So if somebody that knows you well were asked to rate you on your effectiveness as a listener, now you might want to not ask your spouse or significant other because they might want to be a little biased. I know Cal and I, I probably would not ask him how he would rate me, but if somebody who knew you really well were to rate you, would they give you a nine or a 10 on the listening scale? Well, this, this uh, simple word, listen, has really changed my life. And I've come to appreciate over the past few years because I have found myself, as I've traveled to various places, sat in various cultures and various situations, just the significance of sitting and being present and listening. Listening to stories that are very different than my own. Listening to cultural differences. I've sat in refugee camps and especially listening to the stories of women and their resilience and just what they've gone through. I have sat with groups of, um, with different cultural differences and with women and different people just, just to understand, to listen to understand and, and just hear what's, what, what I don't know, what's not my life experience. So I want to ask you a question. What is the difference between hearing and listening? Because you kind of go, well, if I've heard something or I've listened, isn't the same thing? Well, according to the dictionary, hearing is defined as the process, the function, or power of of perceiving a sound. Hearing is passive. You see, it's like with our eyes, if we don't want to see something, we close our eyes and we don't see it. With our ears, with all the noise going around us, you know, it could be traffic, it could be music, it could hear voices, you don't turn your ears off. You just can't do that. So hearing is passive. It, it's involuntary. You just can't, you can't do that. On the other hand, the, the word listen means to hear something with thoughtful attention. So I want to suggest that listening is active because in a crowded room, in, with all this noise and space, 
we decide what voice we're going to listen to. You can be outside and there's traffic and there's music and there's somebody with you and you can choose to kind of tune out those things and focus on the voice of the person next to you. We have that ability. So listening is active. Many times in the New Testament, you would read Jesus saying this, to him who has ears to hear. And then he would proceed to share a parable or a story. To him who has ears to hear. Now that word hear, what does that mean? What is Jesus saying when he says to hear? Well, now Jesus, being a a Jewish man, would have spoken not in English, and our English word, our English vocabulary doesn't doesn't do rightly with that word. It kind of falls flat in our vocabulary. It's kind of one-dimensional. But Jesus would have spoken in either Hebrew or Aramaic. And the word he would have used would have been the word shama. And shama means to hear, to listen to, to obey. You see, the word when he said, to him who has ears to hear, he's saying that you will hear, that you will listen, and that will you obey. You see, in our English vocabulary, when we say, we will say something like, I heard you, and then we'll just walk away. And we'll think we're done, right? I heard you, and we're done. We've moved on to the next thing. But in that culture, that was not the case. You had to listen, and you had to obey. So to listen is to engage your whole being. Listen with your eyes, with your heart, with your whole person. It's listening to love. I want to share a story um, of a really good friend of mine, several, a couple, right before, actually, right before the pandemic hit. I had the opportunity to meet in person a really special woman. Her name is Ginger Sunbird Martin. And I got to hear her in person, and I got to be, she was telling a story. She was sharing, she's from the Gila River Indian community. And there was a group of us that were listening to her out in her community tell, uh, tell stories telling the story of the past, the history, and some of the realities of today. And her storytelling ability was captivating. And we stood there, and we listened to her. And when she was done, I immediately went to her, and I'm like, i got to learn more from you. Because the way you tell a story, the heart in which you tell a story, I've got to learn more from you. And then right after that, we had lockdown. But we connected. And through the lockdown, we started a conversation and we started a friendship. And we would talk on the phone because I wanted to learn more about tribal culture, tribal culture values um, compared to our culture. And Ginger is someone who teaches that. She trains on that. She is a dynamic leader in her community. And I knew I need to listen to her. And so over the course of time, we just developed this friendship. We developed this trust. I felt comfortable to ask her any questions, to say anything to her. And in one particular conversation, I asked her a question. I'd been wanting to ask this question. I felt like this was safe enough to ask her, so I asked her a question. And when I asked her this question, there was a long pause afterwards, and there was this silence. Now, I don't do good in silence. I feel like I have to fill it with words, right? So I just sat there for a moment. It was a little uncomfortable. It was quiet. And then um, I kind of realized that maybe I didn't ask that question really well. So I remember saying, Ginger, did I just offend you? Did I just ask that question in an inappropriate way? And I will never forget what she said to me because her, her words have literally transformed my life. And what she said to me was, Lisa, I listened to the words of your heart. I didn't listen to your English words. I didn't let your English words get in the way because I know you. And I said, what do you mean? She goes, well, in our culture, the way you asked that, you said, can I? In our culture, we're a second and third person culture. We would never use I. And I said, okay, can you help me? How, how should I have asked that question? She said, well, You could have said, would it be possible for someone to do this? And so in that moment, she listened to the words of my heart. She didn't let my, she wasn't offended by the, but my English words that got in the way that were messy. And in that moment and in that conversation, I knew how much she cared about me and our friendship deepened. And ever since I have learned so much from this woman, and I'm so grateful for her in my life. So next time you get ready to have a conversation with someone, I want you to consider these facts. We listen at 125 to 250 words per minute, 
but think at 1,000 to 3,000 words per minute. Can you even imagine conversations going on? 85% of what we have learned is through listening, not talking or reading. And 75% of the time, we are distracted, preoccupied, or forgetful. Now, I don't know about you, that's not that shocking to me because I know myself, and I know sometimes I can be in a conversation in a crowded room, and FOMO kicks in, right? Because it's like, I want to know what I'm, what am I missing? What's going on? And I have to really make myself focus my attention and be fully present with someone. But 75% of the time, we are usually distracted in a conversation. So let me ask you this question. What are we missing by not listening and being fully present with somebody in that moment? What if we talked less and listened more? Are we giving God and others in our lives a chance to truly be heard? Because to listen is to love, and listening has the power to change our world. I want to suggest three areas where listening can be transformational in our lives. First of all, when we listen to God. Second, when we listen to others. And third, when we listen to ourselves. You see, we have a God who listens. He's fully present. He's in the moment with us. And Jesus knew that the best ways to minister to people is by listening, and by listening, he loves, and he was loving us. Jeremiah 29, 12 says, Then you will call upon me and come and pray for me, to me, and I will hear you. Hear, I will listen, I will respond. Have you ever thought about a posture of listening? Is there a posture to listening, or is it just with our ears? I read a verse in Psalms, a couple years ago that literally changed my view on, on God and even how God interacts with me. Because a lot of times I think, we think of a God that's rigid, that just kind of stands there, that listens to us, that's not totally engaged. And I'm gonna read this first because I think you might join me in seeing a different a view of God. It says one, Psalm 116, one and two. I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my prayer for mercy. Because he bends down to listen, I will pray as long as I have breath. I love that imagery of God coming to us and he bends down and he looks at us and I think he looks at us in the eye and he says, I see you, I hear you, I'm listening and I'm responding with love. You know, this posturing of bending down, of getting kneeling before somebody It's a posture of humility, not power. And that's how we see that God comes to us. Not in a powerful way, which he could, but he chooses to come to us humbly and with love. I find that it makes a difference, this posture. I've thought about this more because we have eight grandkids, ages three to 13. Now, a couple of them I'm looking up to these days, but a lot of the little ones are still little and young enough. And when they start speaking to me, there's, there's nothing better than a voice of a child. And when I remember just hearing my own kids' voice when they were little and now your grandchildren. And so they start to speak. And first of all, it's really hard to understand them uh, and some of the little ones. But when they start speaking, I find myself kneeling down in front of them, trying to get closer to them, to hear them, to read their lips, to read their eyes, to see the full expression on their face. Because a lot of times when they're talking to me, their eyes are twinkling. They're, they're, they're so excited. And if I stand up like this and look down at them, I will miss all of that. And so just the posturing of getting down, meeting somebody where they're at. I think it's just, it's more than a physical, physical posturing, but are we, when we're listening to somebody, are we where they are at listening to them? Are we engaging the full being? Because I think it matters. It matters to them and it matters to me because when we're in proximity like that, it breaks down barriers and walls come down because we're together, we're in that moment. Then I also think there's a posturing of looking up. Sometimes we look down, we can kneel down and be with somebody, but also we get so, um, you know, we're in this journey of life and we're so on a mission and we're moving and we forget to look around, we forget to look up even. And I want to share a verse with you where Jesus actually looks up to find somebody to meet them where they're at. And it's in Luke 19, 1 through 6, it's a story about Zacchaeus. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead, and he climbed a sycamore tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus 
and he called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home. I can't even imagine being Zacchaeus and having Jesus walking, you have to admit, he's, he's in a crowd, he's walking. People are just coming around him, trying to be near him. And Jesus stops and he looks up and he sees Zac- Zacchaeus and he calls him by name. I think it's a beautiful imagery of a God who searches for us, who seeks us out to find us and to listen to us. Many of us would, would love to hear an audible voice of God speak to us. But just because we don't doesn't mean that God isn't speaking because God is always communicating. And there are many ways that he communicates to us. He communicates to us through the Bible, through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, and I believe he communicates to us through others. You know, this thing about the Bible, it's a, it's a beautiful story, basically. The Bible is a story. It's a divine love story of a creator God and how he loves humankind. And we just see that throughout the Bible, we are the object of his unconditional and unfailing love. He is searching for us. He wants us to know how much he loves us and to what lengths he will go to bring us back. In Genesis 3 in the Old Testament, we see that man turns his back on God and the rest of the biblical story is God trying to win us back and to go, I'm here, I'm here, I'm with you and I wanna be with you. The Bible is filled, like any good story we talked about, the Bible, the story of the Bible is filled with all the elements that make up a good story. There's tension, there's conflict, there's suspense, there's mystery, but above all, there is love. And that's what we see in the story of the Bible and the story of God. You know, as parents, I don't know about you, like, you know, just imagine sitting around the family table. There's nothing we want more as parents than to have our children sit at a table, so to speak, and love each other. Now, this doesn't mean that they always will agree, that they always get along, that they see life the same, that they have the same experiences, that they have the same opinions or perspectives. That's okay, because it is not about uniformity, it's about unity. And it really matters, because we want harmony at the family table. Do you think God wants anything different for his children? He created all of us the same in his image. It doesn't matter ethnicity or gender. It doesn't matter because we are all children of God created in his image. And I think it breaks his heart when he sees what's happening in our world today. The division, the polarization, the hatred, the animosity. I think it breaks his heart because he's like, this is not what I wish for you. This is not what's best for you. This is not how I created things to be. John 17, 20 through 23 says... I am praying not only for these disciples, this is Jesus' words, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will be all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Let me ask you a question. What if God listened to us like we listened to him? Would we be okay with that? Would we be okay with the way he listens to us with the way we listen to him? We know that God is listening to us, that God hears us. He responds to us. He hears our pains. He hears our sorrows. He hears our dashed dreams, but he also hears our hopes, our desires, the things that we want in life, the joys, the celebrations. He's with us in all those places. So the second area I wanna suggest that is transformational in our listening is when we listen to others. I just returned Thursday night from an eight day trip, uh, taking a deep drive dive into um, the American, our American narrative. Um, touring some of the sites in the South where some of our history of the transatlantic slave trade with enslaved people to the Civil War era, to the Civil Rights era, era, and to the realities of today. And we talked and we visited with different leaders, community leaders, faith leaders, ordinary people and their story, just to understand, to listen to understand, to listen to learn, and to glean from them because their, their story is different than ours. 
We had a diverse group. We had a group of 16 from Central, and we traveled together, and we were a diverse group. And so our stories, our histories, our families of origin were very different. And we would sit in these, I call them sacred space, where we could just be real with each other and share. And I got to tell you, we had moments that were hard, that were painful, that were messy, because we were sharing some of our realities, and some of it's hard to hear. But that doesn't mean we don't listen because we need to be listening to each other. We need to hear each other's stories and understand and hold them and honor them for what they are. But I, as hard as it was, it was also rich, it was beautiful, and it was transformative. Now I know last week Cal shared a story of two brothers who were wrongly convicted and imprisoned for over 20 years for crimes they didn't commit. We also had the opportunity to meet with two men Jerome and Robert, who had similar stories. They were wrongly convicted, sentenced to prison, served over 20 years for crimes they did not commit. And so we listened to them. The beautiful thing about them is they had every right to be angry, to be resentful, and there was a lot of pain. One, Jerome had, the time when he was incarcerated, had a, a young, young son, and so he missed all those years with his child. But just a couple of years ago, they were each released. Um, and one of the men, Robert Jones, had really fought for many years for his own conviction to be uh, overturned. And so it was. After 23 years of wrongfully serving time in prison, he was released. And today, among other ro uh, roles he plays, he is the client advocate with the Orleans Public Defender's Office in New Orleans. One of the most amazing things about these men is that they, they realized their story wasn't wasted. It wasn't the story they wanted. It was injustice that had happened to them. But yet they're choosing to use their story to help so many others. And so they're fighting on behalf of others so this doesn't continue to happen. And you just see love. They're listening and they're responding in love. Robert Jones, one of the men, said this. When we first love ourselves in spite of our shortcomings, it makes it easier to love others. These were just two of the stories that we heard. And as we would sit in these spaces and listen to these stories, our hearts were broken, our souls were disrupted. But together we listened, together we prayed, and together we breathed deeply. And our listening challenged each one of us to really ask ourselves, what does it look like to listen and to respond in love? How do we love? How do we see through the eyes and the heart of Jesus? If we truly listen, we must love and respond. Proverbs 31, 8 and 9 says this, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and helpless and see that they get justice. Psalms 146, 7 through 9 says this, He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. And that word wicked means someone who mistreats another human being, who denies them their God-given dignity and worth. And we see that God frustrates the wicked. You see, we can, sometimes we need to be reminded of who we are, that we are the body of Christ and all our diversity and all of our differences and all our opinions and all of our experiences and with all of our realities, we are the body of Christ and we come together as children of God. 1 Corinthians 12, 25 through 27 says this, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you are a part of it. What does that look like? If we truly see that in our differences we are one, we are united, we are the body of Christ, and as we are united, the world will see a different story than their story they're seeing in the world. You know, Many of us were taught as children, and we teach it to our kids, the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. I want to change that a little, a little bit. What if we listen to others the way we want others to listen to us? Would that make a difference? Would that change things? So let me ask you a few questions here to 
get us thinking. I love questions, like I said, I think they take us on a journey of discovery. Who do you need to listen to? Is there a family member? Is there a friend? Is there a coworker? Is there somebody in your life that you just really haven't listened to in a while that you probably think it would be, it would be beneficial? Whose story do you need to hear that is different than your own? Who has a different story, a different life experience that you could listen to, that you could hear? And what if you ask somebody, what is your story? I find that's a great opener. Because sometimes, I, it, it's a lot of people, it feels awkward to go up to somebody and, how do I have a conversation? How do I ask something to just be able to listen? And I find that a great question is, what is your story? And let people tell you their story. A lot of times in the world where it's gotten us to places we want to go because we have told people what their story is. We have defined them and not let them tell us who they are. We listen to love and to respond with empathy. The third area I think of listening that's transformational is listening to ourselves. Have you listened to your own story lately? And that might be an awkward question. We go, my own story, I know myself. I know myself pretty well. But no, have you really listened to your own story and what story are you telling yourself? To really be honest with you, I, I find myself a lot of times not telling a really good story to myself because I can be hard on myself. I can beat myself up. And I can focus on the things I don't like instead of focusing on the things that are good about myself and how God created me. Um, a lot of times I think we find ourselves dismissing our story, denying it, just kind of pushing it aside. And I think especially for women, because we're constantly pouring into other people, we pour into our children, our families, our husbands, our significant others, our coworkers, wherever it is, we're constantly pouring out. And it's hard to take time for ourselves because a lot of times we feel like we're being selfish when we do that. But it's, being, it's taking care of ourselves. It's self-care when we do that. When we even take time to just find a few moments ago, who am I? You know, if life goes on and on, you know, we find different situations, circumstances, and we're constantly needing to ask that question, who am I now? Who am I now? And so I think it's important to know who we are. So how do we listen to our own story and listen to it well? I don't think we can know ourselves and listen to our own story without listening to God. And I don't think we can listen, really listen to God without really listening to others. And I think the three go together. When you listen to yourself, you've got to listen to others and you've got to listen to God. And when you listen to God... You listen to others and yourself. It's all together. You cannot separate them. It's a holistic approach to that. So how do we listen to our story and truly honor it? Realizing that there's imperfections, there's tensions, there's struggles, and there's pain. But how do we also honor the courage, the bravery, the resilience in our own story? How do we remember that each one of us were created in the image of God and that he loves us unconditionally, and that we matter. Matthew 22, 37 through 39 says this. When Jesus was asked by one of the Pharisees, what is the greatest commandment of the law? And Jesus said this. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. As yourself, that's hard. That's a hard one. In these verses, Jesus emphasized the need for right relationships with God, with others, and, our, and ourselves. Because this is what a family looks like. This is what the body of Christ looks like. When we truly listen to each other and are present with each other. I want to read a book right now that I happened to find this week while we were visiting the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama. And the Legacy Museum was founded by the Equal Justice Initiative. And you may be familiar with the name Brian Stevenson, who wrote the book Just Mercy, which later came out as a movie, Just Mercy. And the museum is, has on dis display the history of slavery and racism in America from the enslavement to mass incarceration. And as I was walking through this museum and the exhibits and listening to the stories they were telling, it just gripped my heart. And um, it's, it's, it's a place we all need to, to go to and just to hear some of the history and from a different perspective even. But then I, I was walking through and there was a book um, there in the gift shop that just caught my attention. And so I started going through the pages and I thought, I need to get this book. I need to read this. Now, the book is I Am Enough by Grace 
buyers. And it's written as a children's book. It's a picture book. If you have kids, you understand that difference in a picture book and a chapter book. But I want to suggest that perhaps this is a chapter book that is written for adults. Because this is a message not just for children, but this is a message that we all need to be reminded and we all need to hear. So I'm going to read this story. Like the sun, I'm here to shine. Like the voice, I'm here to sing. Like the bird, I'm here to fly and soar high over everything. Like the trees, I'm here to grow. Like the mountains, here to stand. Like time, I'm here to be and be everything I can. Like the champ, I'm here to fight. Like the heart, I'm here to love. Like a ladder, here to climb. And like the air, to rise above. Like the wind, I'm here to push. Like a rope, I'm here to pull. Like the rain, I'm here to pour and drip and fall apart. I'm full. Like the moon, I'm here to dream. Like the student, here to learn. Like the water, here to swell. Like the fire, here to burn. Like the winner, I'm here to win. And if I don't, I'll get up again. I know that I may sometimes cry, but even then, I'm here to try. I'm not meant to be like you. You're not meant to be like me. Sometimes we will get along, and sometimes we'll disagree. I know that we don't look the same, our skin, our eyes, our hair, our frame. But that does not dictate our worth. We both have places here on earth. And in the end, we are right, right here to live a life of love, not fear. To help each other when it's tough. To say together, I am enough. And that's a message I just want to remind us, that each one of us, we are enough. And when we listen to our own stories with empathy and compassion... We change not only ourselves, but those around us. So in conclusion, I just want to share. So what happens when we truly listen, hear, and respond to God? I think chains are broken. Sin's forgiven. Healing happens. Hope is lived. Love embraced. Dignity restored. Because he is, we are. He is enough. And what happens when we listen to others? Relationships are restored. Healing happens. Unity results. Injustices cease. Because he is, we all are. We are enough. What happens when we listen to ourselves? Chains are broken. Freedom is realized. Hope rises. There's love for self. Dignity restored. Because he is, I am. I am enough. You know, your story and my story can't be lived alone. It can't be lived separately in isolation because my humanity is connected and tied into your humanity. I can't flourish at the expense of you and you can't flourish at the expense of me. We all must flourish together. And And we must fight for a world in which we all flourish together. And that's the body of Christ. And that's what love does. And that's what happens when we listen to each other. To live our best life and to make a great story, we must listen to God and listen to others and ourselves. And as a result, love responds and love happens in our world. When we listen with love, we can create a better story, a better future for generations to come. Now, I know that many women today sitting here, this is a hard day. And I want to say again that I know it represents loss and unmet expectations and un fulfilled dreams. I know not every woman is a mom here, but I also want to share just a story, because I know that today is is a happy day, and it's a sad day, and we hold both. We hold both tensions. I lost my mom in 1998, and when I was watching that video earlier, that bumper, all the feels in that thing, you know, and I I just took me to that place, because I, my mom has been gone for 24 years, and I still to this day want to pick up the phone and call her and tell her about something. I wish she could have met my grandkids, her great grandkids. I wish she could have seen her grandkids grow up and see the the spouses that they chose and married. She'd be so proud. My mom loved kids. She was a teacher. My mom was fun. She was funny. She was one of my best friends. We had so many great memories together and her life ended way too soon. And I still miss her. One of the things I miss the most as I miss her voice. I long to hear her voice again. 
And there was something about her voice that just made life okay. Especially when you're sick, you're not feeling well, you're having a bad day. You just want to hear that voice to know, to just put life in perspective. I think we have a Heavenly Father who longs to hear our voice. And his voice, and so he, we can know our story and what he thinks about us. And do you long to hear his voice? When's the last time you heard his voice? You just set, took time to be still and to be present and to listen to the voice of God, a voice of love. Pope Francis said this, obeying God is listening to God, having an open heart to follow the path that God points out to us. Are you listening with an open heart? Are you listening to stories? Are you listening to God? Are you listening to yourself? Are you hearing and are you obeying God in the relationships that you have with others and with yourself? When we do this, when we listen to love, we can change our world. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are a God who loves. You're a God who sees. You're a God who's with us in the moments. You're fully present. You're not distracted. You long to hear our voice. Help us long to hear yours. Help us listen to you, to hear and to obey. Help us to have the courage to listen to others who may have a different story, a different narrative. Help us to sit in those spaces and honor the stories of each one of us and know that we are a family, that you want us united in this world. And that when we are united, amazing things can happen. And then, Lord, give us courage to listen to our own stories and help us to put away the shame that could be there, um, the disappointments that we've had with maybe with ourselves to realize that doesn't define us. What, what defines us and who defines us is you. And you want us to live our best life because you are with us. Lord, I pray if there's someone here today that just needs to turn their attention to you to truly listen to you, that you would turn them to you. And thank you that you kneel down with us in humility and not in power and that you see us and you listen to our voice and it makes you smile. God, we love you and we thank you for the love you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen.